Thanks so much for being here, Christoph. I'm super excited to speak to you. Great. Actually, uh, for anyone who's listening and might not know you yet, could you introduce yourself? Yeah, so my name is Christoph Parr. Um, I'm a professor at the um, Max Planck Institute for Security and Privacy in, in Bochum, Germany. Max Planck Institute are big uh, federally funded research institutes, somewhat elite uh, institutions. Um, I'm also a um, research professor at uh, the University of Massachusetts at Amherst. And um, in total, I taught uh, for 10 years in the US, all in Massachusetts. So I, I actually started my career at uh, Worcester Polytechnic Institute in MA. Uh, and I also taught for about three years at UMass Amherst. So I, I spent a lot of time both in, um, on the East Coast of the US and in uh, Germany. Very cool. I think I'd love to kind of start at the beginning of your journey and ask you how you first got interested in cryptography. Yeah. This is a really good, great question. So I'm, I'm a trained engineer, electrical engineer. I got my uh, PhD on a on a, a pretty tame topic, uh, coding theory, applied coding theory in, in Germany. So that's related to communication engineering. Um, and I, uh, you know, I like being a researcher, so I enjoyed that, but I never, to be honest, I never got fully into this topic of coding or communication theory, right, with my heart, so to speak. Um, and during my PhD, I had a long distance relationship with my now wife, Sarah, who's actually from New York. <laughs> And so after getting my PhD in 94, it was, was clear that I was, uh, um, uh, that I should move to the US and um, I applied and I was super lucky and uh, because the electrical engineering department at WPI hired me, but I wanted to switch topics. So I applied and saying, you know, see my background is coding. I want to go get into uh, cryptography and, you know, that was late 94, which was just when the dot-com boom was taking off, right? Mm -hmm. And they were, they had a, they had a, you know, a very good perspective, which is very impressive looking back at WPI. So, uh, um, you know, they took the gamble and said, let's hire Christoph, right? Nice enough guy. <laughs> Doesn't have any research experience in cryptography, but this is going to be a hot topic. And uh, again, I'm, 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 you know, looking back 25 years later, it was very impressive that they had this uh, foresight yeah, so I uh, started then in, in January 95, I started WPI and I started to develop my first course in cryptography and my all background, my whole background had been like one seminar on, on DES, DS, which is by, by now an outdated algorithm, so I, I didn't know anything. And there was hardly any um, literature out there in terms of, of teaching cryptography, right? So there wasn't like a, you know, a, a canonical approach, a standardized approach, how to teach that, you know, we all know how to teach calculus, right, how to, to teach uh, CS 101 and so forth, how to teach English writing or English literature, we know how to do that, we, I didn't know, I think very few people knew how to teach cryptography back then, yeah, mm -hmm. and uh, the only uh, pieces of literature that exist is, is Bruce Schneier's famous book, right, Applied Cryptography, which had come out a few years earlier, which is a great book and it was super helpful, but it's not a textbook, right? It's a collection of, of technical methods. And uh, kind of on the opposite of uh, uh, opposite end of the spectrum was a book, which is, I don't know whether it's still in print by Doug Stinson, uh, excellent researcher at the um, University of Waterloo. He had just published a, a rather theoretical textbook in cryptography. So and I got an early version of that from the publisher, which was photocopied, right, with a ring binding that wasn't even bound. So I had these these two pieces, and you know, I looked at uh, you know looked at the internet, looked at the research literature, and created my first crypto course in the fall semester of '95. Yeah, so that's in a in a you know with many words explained how I got started. Yeah. What was it about cryptography? Was there one in particular thing you can remember that you just thought was very interesting and made you want to learn more about it and kind of dedicate your career to it? Yeah, that's a good point, right? I said before, I wasn't, you know, it was never I got, you know, that emotionally uh, uh, excited or drawn into coding theory, the topic of my PhD. Mm -hmm. You know, what I, I think what, what fascinates me and many, many millions of other people worldwide is. In, in, in cryptography, it's a secret code thing, right? So we have like this notion of spies and you want to hide something. And you have a, a, um, the notion of an opponent, right? Who, so you try to hide some, something and you also try 
you have always an opponent in your mind who tries to break that. So this is this, this competitive um, aspect in cryptography and in cybersecurity, mm -hmm. which you don't have in, in uh, I think, in any other technical discipline and so on. I think I always found that fascinating, right? So it, it pulled me into it. I was toying around a little bit in my PhD, so I was reading a little bit, but I actually know that I, the thing about it, I did talk with my PhD advisor about it, said, you know, could I, couldn't I do more in cryptography? And he said, yeah, we, we, we all love cryptography, he said, you know, but I was more than halfway done, he said, it would be a waste of time if you know switch to cryptography. So, and again, I was, uh, um, you know, I was very fascinated by that and the, uh, not only me, because then once I started uh, offering the first talk, uh, first course, first graduate course at WPI, of course, that was a, a special topic course, right? But because it's such an interesting topic, I, all, I never had problems finding students. So they were always very popular courses that I taught him. Yeah. yeah, yeah, I think it's the same for me. It's very interesting. Um, and the idea of just that it's this industry that's kind of been in a war ever since it begun between the, you know, the code makers and the code breakers. And it's just ongoing. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And, uh, and, and even when I started, a lot of things weren't that clear. There was still this discussion should we use uh, um, secret algorithms, right? Which is a topic which actually I, I discuss in my first lecture of my YouTube videos, right? So our intuition is come up with your own code, right? With your own crypto system, right? The intuition is this is more secure, right? Because the, the, the opponents, bad guys don't know about it, right? And again, when I started teaching crypto, that was not told, there, were, there was a, a common misperception. Many people in the industry even thought it's better to use uh, secret algorithms, right? Mm -hmm. which, which means un, uh, unproven um, uh, uh, algorithms. So there was a lot of, uh, of misconception out there back then. Yeah, I really want to get into that um, a little bit more. Sure. Um, I think for anyone who is listening and doesn't know, could you give a definition of what is cryptography? Yeah, so cryptography by itself is, is, is you know, with, with crypto, you can achieve a lot of security goals, which is pretty wishy-washy, right? But the, 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 the easiest way, and which is which you still often read, is, is saying uh, cryptography is about hiding messages, right? Um, the fancy terms, the more formal term that we use is confidentiality. So you, for instance, you try to hide an, an email or a PDF, right? So you try to encrypt that. It turns out that there are many other things you can do with cryptography. That's why I'm a little careful saying, you know, cryptography is not only about hiding messages. You can provide digital signatures, for instance, so you can prove that a message has not been tampered with, which is very important, right? If you think about e-commerce, for instance, um, you can uh, prove that a message is coming from a certain person. Again, you know, if you think about digital contracts, it's important. We can even create cryptocurrencies uh, with cryptography, right? So it's it's um, it's a uh, uh, I don't know. It's not a universal tool, but it's a it's, it's a very um, versatile tool with which you can do a, a many interesting applications, which typically have to do with with the fact that you want to. Um, uh, do security and security means that uh, that uh, some people have certain capabilities that other people don't have. Again, for instance, signing a digital contract, right? So if you have a crypto system uh, uh, that provides a signature, I can, for instance, sign a PDF file and that becomes then a contract that can be used in real life. So it's always being able to do certain things that people that have cryptographic keys typically can do and other people cannot do. Mm -hmm. Right, it solves this kind of essential problem, um, especially on the internet of two people are trying to communicate and they want to privately do that. You don't want other people to intercept your message or your credit card. Um, but then, like you said, there are all these other use cases like um, digital signatures or now cryptocurrencies. Um, yeah, and I should also note, I think uh, I've realized since working um, in kind of the cybersecurity field that I think security or cryptographer cryptographers view, they say crypto and they mean cryptography, but now a lot of people say crypto and they mean cryptocurrencies. Um, so I'll yeah. just note when we say crypto in the interview, we're talking about cryptography, but it's funny because it, it's a word that means two different things to people. <laughs> Thanks for clarifying that. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> yeah on, on, on the upside, you know, this is the biggest uh, uh, crypto, the biggest and oldest uh, uh, cryptography conference is, is crypto, actually, you're wearing a t-shirt here from crypto. 
2015, which had been uh, uh, had been at um, the camps of UC Santa Barbara since 1980, 1981, something like that. And um, I think prior to cryptocurrencies, we got 300, 400 people. And now because of cryptocurrency, suddenly this highly technical conference is swamped with people from the financial sector. <laughs> yeah, that is really they're interesting. They just hear crypto and said, let's go there, right? It's, it's a great conference, wow. but, but I think it's probably good. I'm a little bit afraid it goes over the head of some people if you just have a, a, a cryptocurrency background. <laughs> Yeah, that is so interesting. Um, I have, you know, friend, like I remember a few years ago when I started working in a security company and I learned about, um, you know, like public keys, but then because of uh, cryptocurrencies, I have friends who were learning about them and, you know, never, they were never interested before, but now because of cryptocurrencies, um, it seems like more and more people are interested in cryptography itself too, which is very cool. Yeah, I like it too. I mean, it's good, yeah, it's good, good for business. Yeah, if you <laughs> Um, so you already kind of touched on some examples, but I think um, for anyone who's listening, they most people use cryptography every day, but we don't even realize it. Um, it's kind of this thing in the background of our lives. It's very prevalent. Um, you already gave a few examples, but could you give some more examples of, you know, when do normal people use cryptography and how do we depend on it in our everyday lives? This is an excellent question. And I think the, the, the oldest mass application for cryptography is actually cell phones. So particularly this is this, which is now being phased out as a GSM phone standard, which is uh, also called 3G. Uh, that was the first uh, mass application for cryptography where the, um, I'm getting my, my smartphone out, right? My, my, you know, my, my beloved iPhone 8. So um, what they did early on, so we talked 1980s, the, the um, over-the-air communication between my cell phone and the base stage, uh, station was encrypted with uh, um, algorithms, which are actually not terrible secure anymore, you know, now 40 or 50 years later. So that is one um, application. It's still, of course, you know, a, a mobile phone communication is um, encrypted. It goes through my... Um, I'm going through my pocket here, right, of my, my jeans. So the other one, which is dates back to the 1990s, which is true for most people, you know, so this is my Prius key here, right? Mm -hmm. So we all know that when I push the button, it opens, and this is heavily protected by cryptography. Um, what most people, and, 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 you know, everybody thinks, okay, this is cryptography has to be secure. If you want to prevent car theft, there is even a second crypto algorithm on board, which is active if I put that into the lock and I start the engine. The, the one is the, the um, uh, keyless entry system. The other is the actual um, locking system for the engine. So these are two different uh, uh, crypto systems. And typically, you actually have two chips on, the, on your modern car key. And they are uh, uh, they're kind, kind of similar, typically symmetric cryptography. But so this is another everyday example. Um, here is my ATM card, right, of the local bank here in Western Massachusetts. You all, we all see the chip on it, right? And now this is a brand new card, which you can tap, right? And then we get this, this, this wireless connection, right, for, for making purchases. Again, there's cryptography on board. You see this little golden chip here, right? This, there's a, there's a, a, a chip underneath, and, um, which, and, and to be honest, the main function of this is providing security. There's a whole uh, um, ensemble of cryptographic uh, algorithms and cryptographic protocols built in here that allow you to do financial transactions. So this is maybe like a you know, brief overview. And I randomly, you know, believe me, Madison, I didn't prepare for that question. So <laughs> these, were, you know, these were all things, right, uh, uh, that mm -hmm. I had in my pocket anyway. So it's very everyday. And I'm, I'm not even that, that tech savvy. I'm pretty late adopter, right? Um, yeah, so but many then, of examples. course, you, yeah, please go ahead, yeah. Oh, just, yeah, it's, it's kind of once I started, um, and in your photography course on YouTube, you start pointing out examples and the students are shouting out examples and it really, you just see it in every area of life. Um, and yeah, you don't realize it until you start counting out how many different ways it's there. Right. And of course, you know, which is, I mean, these are kind of, you know, they're nice to show here. Every, almost every time I do web browsing, right, we you know this little lock going on and you get, you have this HTTPS mm -hmm. connection, right, as the URL and this S mm -hmm. stands for secure. Then actually, the, 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 uh, what we call the TLS, 
transport layer security protocol is active, which is a very complex cryptographic protocol, right? And so we don't okay. even think about it anymore. Yeah. Okay. So for all of these, we need to essentially, we have private information that we don't want people to exactly. um, read to get gain access to, and we want to um, encrypt it. And then we want to decrypt it later on. Um, can you talk more about, you know, how would you define encryption and decryption? Yeah, so if, if you do the, the, the plain old encryption decryption, this is a great example. So let's say we want to encrypt the credit card when, you know, while, while web browsing. So um, encryption does some kind of mathematical transformation. So you, you know, you take your credit card numbers and there you do some complex mathematics on that. And part of this mathematics you use a cryptographic key, right? Which is another long number, right? Um, and once we've done that, let's say your credit card or an email that I want to, that I, um, that I encrypted is turned into totally randomly looking ASCII characters. So if you look at an encrypted message, it doesn't make any sense, right? You can't infer anything uh, uh, from that. And then you can do, and then it's safe, so to speak, right? So you can send it over the internet, you know, NSA can wiretap, the German NSA can wiretap, the Russians, the Chinese. If you use modern strong crypto algorithms, people cannot break that. Upon reception, and that's the beauty of cryptography. So if the bank, for instance, gets it or the e-tailer, right? So the, the, you know, the, the, the website with, with whom you communicate and where you want to make a purchase, they, if they have the same cryptographic key that you have, which is often 128-bit string randomly looking 128 zeros and ones, if they have the same 128 zeros and ones that you use for encryption, they can use a similar mathematical formula, which is the decryption algorithms. And you, use this, you have to use the same 128 bits for that. And then voila, you get the original credit card number back, you get the original email back. So that's in a nutshell how cryptography works. And you know, people of, like me and my colleagues in particular who actually build crypto algorithms, they came up with very smart ways of how to do these mathematical transformations that you need for encrypting on the sender side and decryption on the receiver side. Mm -hmm. Right. We have these encryption and decryption algorithms that we use to do all this stuff. Um, so for a long time, these cryptographic algorithms um, were private. Um, is that correct? Yeah, it, it, it's correct. And, you know, I, I hinted on that when, again, when I started teaching about 25 years ago, there was still discussion on that, whether this is maybe the better way of doing it, right? Keeping secret algorithms, right? Mm -hmm. um, right. Yeah. I was going to say, um, because you, you create these algorithms and of course you don't want other people to know how they work because then they can just break your encryption. That's exactly, that's our intuition. And the big insight is this is wrong, right? <laughs> this, is wrong. <laughs> this is wrong. And it's, uh, um, and the, the reason of the, the argument why that is wrong is somewhat twisted. Because what um, the, the, the basic problem with, uh, if you stick with this basic example, you want to encrypt a credit number, you want to encrypt an, an, um, an email, um, it is hard or close to impossible to define to, to find a way to prove that this mathematical transformation, this encryption is really secure. So what's being done in practice is a very hands-on practical engineering type of approach. Namely, we come up with an encryption method or algorithm or whatever you want to call that, right? An encryption method. And you publish that, you make it public and you, 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 you hope that other people try to break that. And if enough very smart people have not succeeded, we get this warm, fuzzy feeling and we say, this is prob probably secure, right? Um, and uh, this is a little bit simplification how I described it, but um, uh, long story made short, by now um, we know that means the scientific community knows very well how to, def how to design these very uh, encryption algorithms, right? How to build these algorithms, right? Um, but even though we know a lot of the mathematics and, and how to design them to make them secure, even though uh, today it's still uh, essentially the only viable path to building strong cryptography to approach is the way I describe it, right? Design 
an algorithm, publish that typically at a cryptographic conference. And then, you know, very smart people jump on it and try to break it. And if, if, if they don't succeed and you wait one or two or three or four years, it, it, it says it's accepted that this is something uh, that is uh, very secure. Right. As a cryptographer, so you create a new cryptographic algorithm, but then you put it out there for experts to essentially try to break it over time. And then, so how can you tell if your algorithm is secure? Is it that less people can break it over time and it kind of stands the test of time? Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's a test of time thing. But again, there is this is a little bit of simplification because for instance, we know um, uh, uh, we know often there's certain design principles. So we know like certain atomic elements uh, um, that we can put in these algorithms which have proven to be secure, which provide certain security levels on, on a small level. What happens in practice if people propose new algorithms is um, that we also have an, a whole ensemble, a whole uh, collection of attack methods, attack algorithms. So these are mathematical methods that you can apply to crypto algorithms, old and new. Um, and uh, uh, this is the first thing that typically happens. So we, we have, we have a, a set of standard attacks against algorithms. So let's look at a new algorithm and can the, a new encryption method and, and, and let's see whether that can be broken. Okay. Makes sense. I wanna shift more to talking about, um, so your kind of area is applied cryptography. Um, and to my understanding, correct me if I'm wrong, I think cryptography, well, it has many areas within it, but there is this difference between applied cryptography and the more theoretical cryptography. Um, okay. Can you talk more about like what these are and what their differences are. Yeah, yeah. yeah so I'm really, I'm, I mentioned that earlier, I'm, I'm training, I'm an electrical engineer, so I'm really interested in how to use the algorithms and also um, not even use how to implement the algorithm, how to put them into practice, how to build, to put them into actual system, right? For instance, I, I spend a lot of time in my career building uh, crypto algorithms that I can fit in these car keys. You know, as you can imagine, you don't have a three gigahertz Intel processor in here, you have something really, really tiny, right, which is maybe one top, which has only 1,000 or 1,000 of the computing power of your laptop CPU, right? So this is a typical uh, problem that um, uh, I enjoy working on. This is applied cryptography. Um, theoretical cryptography, these are people, for instance, that design new crypto algorithms, which is not what I typically do. So I'm, I'm, I'm not a specialist who would be particularly good at uh, uh, creating a new crypto algorithms. Um, but also um, in, in, in modern cryptography has become quite theoretical, qu quite abstract. So they use methods coming typically from theoretical computer science and they um, try to provide uh, certain proofs uh, about often about cryptographic protocols and cryptographic protocols is for instance what's running in our web browser and that's actually a big research topic in, in modern theoretical cryptography can we prove that this tls protocol again which is this little uh, um, lock that goes on if you connect to a secure website can we prove that this whole cryptographic protocol is secure, so use proof techniques, which are really methods, again, from theoretical cryptography or mathematics. Mm -hmm. So, um, and, and this is what, what uh, uh, theory people in my community do. And again, I'm more interested in, so I, I look what those people designed and I'm interested in how to put, uh, get that to use, you know, how to get that, for instance, in car keys. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's kind of my definition, at least of applied cryptography, which is you take the cryptography and then, okay, how are we actually like applying it in um, the real world? Exactly, yeah, yeah, very good, very good, yeah. Um, so I read this book recently, I believe it's called Practical Cryptography. And the authors were talking about how most of our security problems, they argue, um, in cryptography at least, comes from faulty implementation of cryptography. So the cryptography um, is solid, but then the way we implement it. So maybe the code we write to encrypt things in an application is wrong. Um, and I wanted to get your opinion on this. Like, do you agree with those authors? Yeah, very much so. I mean, the, um, which is not that well known for non-cryptographers. Non 
the, 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 the core cryptography, the core encryption algorithms, they're very, very secure. I gave this example before, you know, Madison, if, if we agree on a key, maybe not here in this public channel, but, <laughs> you know, if we agree on, let's say, 128 random bits, right, if you meet in person and we both write the same sequence down. And uh, um, uh, you sent me, for instance, an email later today, right, encrypted with this 128 bits. People, including very powerful intelligence agencies such as the uh, NSA, will not be able to break that, right? If they wire tap, so this is great, right? And again, if, you know, when I started cryptography, that was not that clear whether we have algorithms that are that strong. They are. We have them. So the core cryptography is great, and this is a you know major success story of modern cryptography you know, that we now have the tools to develop, develop these encryption, decryption algorithms that are very secure. But as you, as you said, right, cryptography still gets broken in practice. I think a very current example is that went through the press, I think two or three days ago, right? There was this ransomware attack and I don't know whether people followed the news and the FBI was able to recover a large part of this ransom uh, that was paid, right? What they did as part of that, they broke the cryptography and what they did is they recovered the cryptographic key. And you know, at least according to the New York Times, we don't know how they did that, but it somehow happened. So we see cryptography can still be broken by not going after this core algorithm itself, but by other ways of doing that. And, and, and as you said, Madison, the, the one common approach is looking at the way how it is implemented, right? If people made a mistake there, or by stealing the cryptographic key or a combination of that. Okay, so it's either it could be faulty implementation or just um, getting access to the key, like you said. Right, which is also we know from the Snowden files, right? You know, if you, if you have a you know, highly secure encryption on, on our phone, uh, nobody can break that. But of course, if you get malware on this, on this phone that steals this 128 secret bits, of course, then people can start reading that, right? Mm -hmm. Why do you think um, we are so bad at properly implementing crypto? It's a, a, a lot of, uh, um, it's very, the, the problems that you have with incorrectly implementing that are very, um, uh, are not intuitive. So these are, and, and this notion of having an incorrect implementation that for instance, that allows a crypto key to leak is very unique to cryptography and it's not very intuitive, right? Mm -hmm. And it's also specific to cryptography. So the, um, uh, I typically talk about that in one of my crypto lectures, right? Or if, if, if I teach industry courses, I, I, I give this example. Um, the weird thing is what we are trained to, if you're coding people, right? If you're software people, what we are trained to do is to write code that is uh, functionally correct. Right, so we get some requirements that you know, this is for a code for application X Y Z, some kind of app, right, on, on a smartphone. And then what we do, and we're pretty good at that as, as, as software engineers, as coders, we have an um, we have a set of methods to test whether this function is actually achieved. So that meaning whether the software does actually what what it's supposed to do, right, a new computer game or you know whatever. Give, give, give me you know, ex any example will do. Now, this notion of having a secure implementation, what in the world is that, right? So in, 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 in the absurd situation that makes it, it can even make it somewhat uh, um, bizarre is you can have an implementation which is perfectly fine functionally. So it's like it does exactly what, it, what it's supposed to do, right? The computer game works on my on my app, right? Mm -hmm. Or even my crypto algorithm works perfectly fine. So my software, my encryption software that encrypts my email works perfectly fine. Yet, due to certain properties in the software, the cryptographic key can be stolen. Mm -hmm. But this is not something that I would say comes natural to most people. Yeah, that makes sense. It is, it is um, unintuitive and quite hard. Yeah, yeah. So in order to prevent that, and this is a whole messy game of modern cryptography, you have to look, how do people try to steal keys, right? What are the attack methods, if you wish, right? 
So now you have to look at the attack method. So, and how do I have to change my software implementation of my crypto algorithm so that attack A doesn't work and so that attack B doesn't work, attack C doesn't work. Mm -hmm. And then there's always in the background, which makes crypto cryptography so super hard. Will there be in, in, in four years, will, be, will there be an, a new attack method B, which we don't even know now, right? Which might be able to extract the key from my, from the apps that I have running on my iPhone. Right. So every encryption algorithm that you might implement in an app, for example, you have to stay aware that later on it could become broken, possibly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 You said that, um, you know, when you kind of first began, um, the cryptography wasn't as secure. And so um, would you say that it is becoming more and more secure and it will in the future? Yeah, I would definitely say so. Again, so I think the... the um, the core cryptographic algorithms that we have that you, for instance, that are used for Bitcoin, right? That are used in the HTTPS uh, uh, protocol for, for the web browsing, right? Um, uh, that are used for hard disk encryption, right? This is also in, in included in Microsoft products, for instance. They are super secure, right? So the, 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 the common assumption in the scientific community, but also in governments is all of the algorithms we use nowadays that cannot be broken within the next few decades unless we get quantum computers, which is a different story. Once we get quantum computers, about half of the crypto algorithms we use nowadays can be broken. But uh, um, let's ignore quantum computers because they don't exist, at least not large-scale quantum computers that can use for breaking cryptography. So mm -hmm. this, I would say this is a major triumph of the scientific community in the last 40 years, I would say, you know, since since people have been doing or 45 years, since people have been uh, seriously working on cryptography since about for the last 20 years, since the year 2000, roughly speaking, we, we the, the, um, this ensemble of very strong cryptographic primitives, that's what we call it, it's a fancy term for saying crypto methods or cryptographic methods or crypto algorithms. Uh, um, they were conceived all, you know, around in the last 20 years, 22 years, something like that. And they all seem incredibly secure from, from uh, what we know today. My understanding um, of quantum computing and how it relates to cryptography is essentially that um, there are these, there is cryptography that um, right now would take computers thousands of years to break. But then with quantum computing, um, a quantum computer could break this cryptography in seconds. Um, is that is that right? It, it's right, but there is a little PS to that. If you, um, you know, if you look at any, any textbook, if you, if you look in, in, in my course, in, in my YouTube course, I think within the first 15 minutes, I talk about this, that there are two major branches of cryptography, right? There is traditional uh, cryptography, symmetric cryptography, and asymmetric cryptography, also called public key cryptography. And they're both used, you know, and in almost all applications, we, have, we need both symmetric algorithms and public key algorithms. Mm -hmm. Should we have quantum computers in some people say maybe in 20 years? Um, essentially, the first type of algorithm, the traditional one, symmetric cryptography, cannot be broken with quantum computers. Again, I'm simplifying a little bit, but they essentially cannot be broken. On the other hand, the public key algorithms, which is stuff what you need, for instance, for digital signatures or exchanging cryptographic keys, they can totally be broken, right? So they, they, we have to... Um, we have to yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, so uh, it's, is that what I'm saying about 50% of cryptography mm -hmm. will be broken, which is terrible because almost all applications <laughs> rely on both. But this sounds much more dramatic than it is. It's more or less an historical historic coincidences that can be broken because we the, the only two basic mechanisms, namely factorization and discrete logarithm. And I, I don't want to bore the listeners what that is. <laughs> so there are only two basic mathematical functions that we use for building public key cryptography, which is the crypto algorithm that I use today. However, there are a whole bunch of other algorithms that work totally different, uh, other public key algorithms. There's a very fancy term for that, which is called post-quantum cryptography, which I think was, was coined by Dan Bernstein, which is a colleague of mine in, in, uh, in, in uh, the Netherlands. Um, and um, as we speak, there are major efforts going on administered by NIST, the National Institute of uh, Standard Technology in the US, which does a marvelous job. Essentially, it's a worldwide competition to create new 
public key algorithms that are resistant against quantum computer attacks. And it looks really good. We're already there in, in the kind of the final round. So they have about 10 algorithms. They all look secure against quantum computers and it will take a few more years until uh, those algorithms are actually totally checked and will be standardized. So uh, all is not lost once we have quantum computer. But again, once we have quantum computer, about you know, half of the algorithms that are used today will be in, in unsecure, but then they, will be, they can be replaced by post-quantum cryptography. Okay, recapping that a little, right? So we have yeah. asymmetric cryptography, um, which people might have heard of. It's where you have your public key and you have your private key. And then exactly. we have symmetric cryptography where you have a shared key. So it's the example of Alice and Bob um, when I encrypt, Alice wants to encrypt information and send it to Bob and they share the same uh, private key to do so. And so Absolutely. symmetric cryptography, uh, quantum computing, quantum computers won't break it. But then with public private key, um, that's where the concern is that it could break all of that um, asymmetric cryptography, and which would be very bad. You should teach cryptography. That was much better explained than, than I I'm did. just copying what you said on your courses. I'm just. <laughs> oh, this is great. Yeah, totally. You to yeah, you. yeah, 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 that's exactly. Yeah. And yeah. this, there's often a, a misperception because people say, oh, once, you know, uh, uh, once we have quantum computers, the, the, uh, uh, this will be the end of the world, blah, blah, blah. It's, this is not right. true, right? Yeah. yeah, I remember when I first got into the cybersecurity field and um, people were saying, well, quantum computing could end all encryption. And I was just like, what? It's definitely there's more to it than that. But it was really interesting. Yeah. Yeah, um, yeah. I want to shift more to talking about, um, so your cryptography textbook, and then you also have your popular um, cryptography course on YouTube. And yeah, I remember I first watched it because I read the book, um, the code book a few years ago that was on the history of cryptography, but then I found your course and I just fell in love with photography and I thought it was, there was a lot of scary concepts that I tried reading about, but then I watched your course and I felt like I could really understand it. Um, so I, yeah, I really appreciated that. Um, can you talk more about like, who is your book for um, and who is your yeah. course for? Yeah. So, uh, you know, I, I, I described a little bit my background, you know, that I arrived, you know, on, on, on uh, uh, Ellis Island, so to speak, <laughs> right after getting my PhD with, without knowing cryptography in it. You know, then I had to be, develop my own crypto course, which was looking back probably helpful because I was not trained as a cryptographer, right? So I really had to learn myself. And it was probably in a similar situation that you were, that I didn't understand much of, you know, how cryptography worked. So I really had to teach it myself and I found the few resources that were out there were not always good from a pedagogical point of view and um, I always I totally loved teaching this was actually the reason why I became a professor not so much doing research so initially mm -hmm. uh, because I was TA you my bachelor year you know I was TA for for calculus so I loved it so much and so so I kind of had the um, I, I tried uh, I thought myself Crypto is not as complicated as it sounds, right? So why don't I work, you know, and I taught that because it was a popular course. I typically taught it at least twice per year, sometimes even twice per semester, uh, 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 crypto courses to different uh, student population in, in uh, WPI. So and I always worked very hard on my lecture notes and my lectures to make it very, very accessible for people. That was kind of a challenge. It's still a a challenge for me and I myself and I teach more advanced classes. I'm personally very frustrated when, when I teach some advanced, some new uh, advanced or for me new material. Um, and, you know, then sometimes I have my, my lecture notes here, right, on my, on my uh, uh, graph paper, right, and I put it on the board. And that's also why I still use this, you know, 1920s blackboard with stroke because I, that, that's my, that's kind of my personal goal. Can I, explain it in a way that people can just relax, mm -hmm. just watch, right? You don't need a PhD in number theory, right? And people say, oh, this is how it works. This is a nice way of explaining it. It's not that complicated. And that's and that's kind of my, my, my challenge, what I'm trying to do. Mm -hmm. And I do it both with my online courses that are on YouTube, but also with my book, yeah, which I, which I brought together with Ben Jan Pertz, who's also an, an, an uh, unbelievably good teacher. So yeah, right. So if there's a you know, someone who's completely new to crypto 
um, they can go and watch your course and they won't need any prereqs essentially. Um, what about the math component? Do you feel like there is a certain level of math needed to take your intro to cryptography course? No, there is a level of math needed for certain aspects in particular of, of public key cryptography, right? You, you, you described it very nicely, you have a public key and a secret key and a private key, right? Um, mm -hmm. And these are kind of niche topics within number theory and, and number theory is not a topic we typically learn in school and not even engineering students, right? You don't learn that. So what I'm doing, um, I looked at these very specific topics that are needed and I teach them in my intro course, right? In my intro, in, in, in introductory cryptography course, maybe for the for people listening in, we have um, uh, very large programs and, and um, dedicated bachelor programs in IT security. So our incoming students, they just finished high school in Germany typically, but also with some international students. Uh, so the meaning they're definitely not trained in number theory, right? They're just fresh out of high school. Um, and most of the calculus they learned in high school, not most, they don't need calculus. So you don't need what, what's called, what, what used to be called higher mathematics, right? With, with integrals and differentials and, and derivatives. So you can, you can literally, you can essentially start with middle school mathematics, right? With 10, maybe 10th grade or so mathematics. Um, uh, and then uh, you can follow the lecture. And, and of course, we need more advanced stuff, things such as cyclic groups, as uh, Euclidean algorithm, some modular arithmetic. But this I do teach in my class. So it's not, and, and, and this is probably different than what, what other professors say. We say, okay, so this, this, is, this, is, the, the, this is up to my, my colleagues from the math department, please teach them elementary number theory. I assume the students know that somehow, right, from lectures given by math professors typically. So mm -hmm. I try to, in, no, I try, I integrate it in, into my intro cryptography course because these are uh, literally freshman students, right, 18 or 19 years old that don't mm -hmm. have any background in the mathematics we need. Yeah, I love that you do that because you don't assume that the student already knows things. And I think sometimes if I'm taking a course and then we go over um, something that I don't know, and then I kind of have to pause and you go learn about this entirely other thing. And so, yeah, I appreciate that you, um, yeah, you don't assume that we know things that we might not know. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's good. Yeah. Yeah. And it was a little bit, you know, when I, when I taught it, when, when I started teaching at, at WPI again, you know, 20 years ago uh, or 25 years ago, um, it was a graduate course, but the graduate students, they were mostly engineering and some CS students but even back then, they didn't have any background in number theory. So even for the graduate students, I had to teach them what cyclic groups are, which is for instance, an important concept. So, yeah. Interesting. Mm -hmm. I want to shift a little bit more to talking about um, our view of security today. Um, I know this year there's the, the encrypted chat app Signal, and it's received this large influx of users. Um, you know, some people say that it only got a lot of downloads because Elon Musk tweeted about it. And other people say that um, like the actions of certain big tech has made some people more concerned about how our data is being used and how much access big tech has to our data. Um, from what I know, historically, people don't really care about their own security. Um, so we care about like what is convenient. Um, what's the most convenient chat app to use that all of our friends are on? We don't really care who has our data. Um, I think it seems to be shifting. I think generally I've noticed that people seem to care more about their own security. Um, have you have you been noticing this as well? I think so because actually Signal is my favorite uh, chat app. You know, I, you, traditionally most people in, in Europe use WhatsApp, which is, I don't know, probably some of you listeners know that, but this is, is owned by Facebook, right? So there's pro some privacy concerns of that. Um, and um, uh, Signal, do I have some Signal app here? Yeah, you can advertise Signal, I guess, yeah. Right, okay, so uh, this is my Signal app here. Uh, so it works like most uh, uh, um, um, instant messengers, but um, once new people join that are already in my contacts, I get this small uh, um, notification, right? And recently, I would say in the last three months, there's so many people that I know that are in my, 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 my uh, iPhone address book joined Signal, which was definitely not the case a year ago. So people definitely get much more concerned. 
um, uh, what, what, um, uh, what, what you sketch is what we call privacy. You know, so it's it's more like uh, uh, protecting our privacy, uh, our private data, and, and people are definitely becoming more and more concerned about that. Yeah. So we said most people normally don't care about security. Um, maybe they right. do a little bit more now. Um, how do you think we should get people to care more about their own security, or should should they care? So, so the short answer is yeah, definitely people should should care about their security, right? The digital security that is very important. The that's an easy answer. The, the, the more difficult answer is how do we get to that point? So, if you, if you look at the whole field of cybersecurity, you know, we, we talked medicine, so we talked the last hour or so, we talked about cryptography, which is a very important part about uh, of cybersecurity, but there are many other parts to that. There's, for instance, software security, there's organizational security, there's hardware security, blah, 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 blah. And one, what I find a particular fascinating subfield of cyber, modern cybersecurity is usable security, which deals with the, with the, the, the interaction of humans and, and, and security. Um, I believe that came into existence in the 1990s when people started thinking about passwords, you know, so what are strong passwords that are hard to guess, but also easy to memorize, which are some, you know, conflicting requirements. Um, and this usable security community, there's more and more an agreement that we, uh, it will be very hard to change the behavior of humans in order to become more secure. We're probably going to lose that race, right? Mm -hmm. um, so the, the question is really, is, is more like an engineering slash behavioral science question. How can we design systems that are inherently secure? You know, we, you, you touched on, on the instant messenger signal and WhatsApp is another one. And there, there are a whole bunch of, of other ones. There's Threema from Switzerland, which is also very good. Um, so they work very well. They have this end-to-end -end encryption built in, meaning they have very strong cryptography. We don't even have to think about it, right? So there's no extra steps from, from uh, by the user needed. So, um, and I think this is probably somewhat of the silver bullet. So we have to design systems, us, you know, you also do software engineering. So us as, as, as security or software engineers, we have to design digital systems uh, that are inherently secure and that are also resilient against uh, uh, errors that are being made by the human users because human users are going to make errors, right? So. Right. That makes sense. So your point is that we can't really change human behavior and get humans to act completely differently. So we need to focus on how can we design systems that are secure where they don't have to do anything extra or we don't have to change our behavior, essentially. Yeah, yeah. With, with, within, limit of, within limits, of course, you know, there's, there's actually a fascinating story about in, in the United States about seatbelts in the 1960s. There were people that we will not be able to teach uh, car drivers to put on seatbelts and stuff, right? But we, we were successful, right? Most people were seatbelts. So within limits, you know, uh, we can probably teach people to pick strong passwords, for instance, right? Okay. But uh, um, if, if, if you rely too much on humans, error will be made because it, it, at the end, co convenience always wins, I think, right? So and then people mm -hmm. will 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 uh, um, not behave uh, securely because it's just more convenient to, to do things incorrectly. That makes sense. It's interesting to think about passwords too, because I know it seems there's kind of a debate on, you know, should we be using passwords? And there's all these other kind of things. Now you can get an email link that will log you into um, a certain thing as a kind of alternative to passwords. And then there are also, it's very interesting that fields, um, I know some people talk about biometrics. So we're using our fingerprints now instead of passwords. And I always think about that scene in the Tom Cruise movie, Minority Report, where a little yeah. um, robotic spider scans his eyeball as kind of a way of identifying him. I, I know we're not there, but it's fun to think of. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, and, and you mentioned that, right, getting an e email or this uh, two-factor uh, authentication, right, where you get some kind of authentication link on your smartphone, right, um, mm -hmm. which is probably which is probably a good system because it doesn't overload the user, right, and it, it provides a much higher level of security. Yeah, yeah. Mm. Um, I want to talk a little bit about uh, backdoors, which I think is a really fascinating part of cryptography. Yeah. Um, so governments want backdoors into cryptography um, as a way of 
according to them, finding the bad actors. Um, can you explain like what is a backdoor? And do you believe governments should have these, these backdoors? Yeah. yeah, excellent question. Yeah. So backdoors are actually are the reason why people want to have backdoors, people meaning <laughs> particular governments, right? Um, is, as I mentioned earlier, modern cryptography is very, very secure. So if you use cryptography correctly, people cannot break that, including law enforcement, for instance, or intelligence services. And um, um, if uh, there's a fascinating story uh, about that, a fascinating case study is the um, discussion about what, what was called the Clipper chip under Clinton. So that was 93, 94, roughly speaking. People should go to Wikipedia and look the, the Clipper chip up in the discussion. It was a very concerted effort by the US government to put a, a backdoor in, in, in cryptography. What that means is you have a crypto algorithm which is which cannot be broken, generally speaking, but there is a backdoor built in. If you have some additional information, which is typically some additional cryptographic key, which is, for instance, held by a government, then the government can still read encrypted traffic, for instance. This is a backdoor. And the, the argument is uh, this, is a famous phrase uh, by a former FBI director, we are going dark, meaning because going cryptography dark. is yeah going dark, right? Because cryptography is now so prevalent, we cannot decrypt, uh, uh, for instance, communication of uh, uh, drug dealers, right? Or organized crimes, or you know, for me personally, more dramatically, child pornographers, right? And and actually, child pornographers is, is a terrible thing. They make heavily use of cryptography, right? So and, mm -hmm. and, and then the law enforcement, and intelligence agency say. Okay, let's put uh, let's put uh, uh, backdoors in cryptographic products so that they can still be broken because we have some special secret knowledge, right? Mm -hmm. So you know, and of, you know, so you can make a case. This might sound like a good idea because we can are more efficient with fighting uh, organized crime or you know fighting child por 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 pornography, there are probably very few people who are in favor of that, right? It's a terrible, terrible thing to do. So, but the, the problem is, <clears throat> it's the like, there is this gigantic likelihood, this gigantic risk, if we put in backdoors in, in our cryptographic products, right, in our instant messengers, in our web browsers and so forth, that not only the, uh, e even if we fully trust the FBI, we say these are the good guys, right? And it's good to arrest criminals, right? We want to be helpful. Odds are sooner or later, this backdoor will be known by bad actors, right? By foreign intelligence services, for instance, or organized crime itself, right? Or other, you know, probably we, we can come up with, with, with crazy ideas uh, who might get access to that, right? And that would have terrible consequences. And this is just a risk we don't want to accept. And this is a this is not only you know Christoph being a big libertarian or something crazy. This which I'm not, but this is <laughs> what uh, this is um, this is like the, the standard opinion in the whole scientific community. So all the people that really know cryptography and data security said, don't put backdoors in. This is a terrible thing. This is way too risky. Don't do that. Yeah, I mean, that is seems like a very tough choice to make because, right, if you have these back doors, then bad guys can take advantage and we become so much less secure. But if you don't have them, then like you said, the child pornographers, then they're going to maybe get away more often um, without yeah. these back doors. Um, so it seems like there's like a push and pull there between, you know, governments wanting back doors um, and um, we obviously don't want them to have them. Uh, exactly. Who do you think is like winning if there was one side winning in that battle right now? Uh, I think it's, uh, I think the backdoor battle seems to, uh, at least in the Western world, you know, in non, uh, uh, non uh, uh, you know, in, in open democracies, um, uh, the good guys are winning in the sense there are, seem to be no backdoors built in. I mean, they're up, uh, you know, in the Snowden files, there were some uh, uh, indications, actually more of an indication, it was actually a, 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 a cryptography standard, which was, uh, uh, had a built-in backdoor. Uh, mm -hmm. So that, uh, so, 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 so we know the, the government enjoys doing that, yeah, tries to do that. But this, 
seems to be a very high likelihood if we use good uh, um, uh, modern products that are often open source or such, such as the, the signal <laughs> instant messengers there are most most likely no backdoors built in okay yeah. and you say the word seem because you don't really know yeah, we, 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 we never know. And actually, I was involved once or twice where, where people asked me as an expert said, you know, we want to buy this product. Uh, uh, like uh, was, was uh, govern, government customer said, you know, how, how do we know there's no vector built in? It's not easy to do. Um, people, probably some people in this, uh, some listeners have heard um, about the discussion uh, that started maybe two years ago about um, uh, equipment, um, computer equipment for 5G communication, right? Built, for instance, by Huawei, right? So the Chinese uh, um, mobile, um, mobile uh, device manufacturer, right? And as far as I know, they're even banned in the United Kingdom. So the UK doesn't allow to use equipment of this manufacturing. And the underlying threat is there are essentially something like backdoors built in. And uh, um, if, if, if you look at something as mobile phone hardware, right, the base stations and all the back, uh, the back end software, these are incredibly uh, complex technical products, both in soft, uh, both uh, in, in hardware, but also in, in software. And even for you know Western governments, that's the UK, and UK is you know allegedly has very strong intelligence services. It's really hard to prove that that uh, um, uh, a certain product is backdoor free. Okay. That's why I said it seems, yeah. Mm -hmm, definitely. Mm -hmm. I want to shift topics a little bit, and I want to ask you, if there's someone listening and they're really interested in cryptography, but they aren't sure, you know, where should they get started? Uh, what would your advice be? That's a good point. So I think the... the, the um, uh, a good thing, you know, you can start with my course, right? So we, we talked about it. It's very accessible, right? You need middle school math for that. So yeah. you, you, get, you get a basic idea. If you yeah. um, want to become um, more serious about it, um, it might not be a bad idea to get a degree in computer science, mm -hmm. you know, that uh, to, to get a broader view. Um, people should bear in mind, you know, cryptography is a really cool thing. I love that, you know, I've been working it for, for 25 years and never, never regretted the choice, right, getting into that field. Mm -hmm. um, but I mentioned that earlier in passing, so this is only, cryptography is only a puzzle piece in, in providing security, right? Typically, we don't want to have encryption, we want to have a secure messengers, you want to do secure web browsing, right? And then Cryptography does play an important role, but there are many other aspects too in, 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 system, in order to build a secure system. So um, just only learning cryptography is not sufficient. So we have to learn other aspects of modern cybersecurity too. Definitely. Yeah, I really recommend anyone who's listening to check out your course. Um, I will link to it, but it is such an incredible um, kind of intro to cryptography course. And you go into a lot of this stuff um, and way more too. Um, but yeah, I think that's a good place to wrap up. Um, Christoph, thank you so much for joining me. It was so fantastic to meet you and talk with you. Madison, thank you so much. This was, uh, I, give, I give interviews once in a while, but this was definitely one of the most pleasant ones I ever had. Thank you so much. Very interesting talking to you. Thank you.